Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Hello and welcome back to Mineral Talks Live. Today is Tuesday, July 20th, 2021. And on behalf of the entire Mineral Talks Live team, it's great to be back. It's been almost exactly seven weeks since our last broadcast on June 2nd, and we've missed you. Moving forward, we will continue this monthly program on the first Wednesday of every month. That means our next show is August 4th, only two weeks away. And we'll tell you about our guest at the end of today's show. For those of you tuning in for the first time, where have you been? Ah, never mind, you're here now, and that's all that matters. I'm Brian Swoboda, the president of Blue Cap Productions, and I'm lucky enough to be partnered with Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez from the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou from the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. Together, we are the Mineral Talks Live team, and we welcome you to the show. Mineral Talks Live is our monthly interactive interview program that we started back in 2020. In this program, we sit down with mineral people from all facets of the mineral world in order to foster a better understanding of what we all do and to highlight some of the different things that we do in the world. From curatrix and curators to collectors, dealers, miners, researchers, artists, and the media that serves us all, we like to cover everyone. We invite you to participate throughout the live show, either through the chat feature or the Q&A feature, both of which are located at the bottom of your Zoom window. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching the live show, and we're all about community. So when you first sign on, go ahead and fire off a hello to everyone telling us where you're from. Also, if you have thoughts or comments during the show, this is where you can post them and interact with each other. Now, usually our guests and I won't be able to read those comments, but Raquel and Eloise will be very active in the chat area and may even interject a question or two during the interview. And speaking of questions, if you have any questions that you really want to ask our guest, go ahead and type it in the Q&A section, and we'll do our best to get to that at the end of the show. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you'll see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions for our Quick Fire 5 segment. This is where we get to see how well you know our guest. It's weird, it's fun, it's wacky, and it's wonderful. So what can I say about today's show that can really do it justice? Well, Other than to say that this is the first time ever we've moved our show from our usual Wednesday slot to a Tuesday. And we did that so that we could take you all on a private tour of the newly redesigned and reopened museum that is on everyone's mind these days, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And to make this occasion even more special, we are graced to have as our private tour guide today, the curator emeritus of the museum and stranger to no one, Dr. George Harlow. George, good afternoon and welcome to the show. Hi everybody, good to be here, good to that you're watching. <laughs> George, great to see you. Again, I really wanna thank you and your entire team for uh, allowing us to come into the museum. Uh, for this kind of private tour. So now, George, at the beginning of every interview, I really love turning back uh, the clock so that uh, we can kind of get to know our guests a little bit more. So let's do that with you. Real quickly, what was the first incident that you remember that grabbed your attention and made you realize that you want to spend your life studying minerals? Oh, that's that's rough. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I took earth science in uh, seventh grade Seventh, eighth grade. Eighth that, grade. That was that was really. I had a really good teacher back then. Um, I always liked outcrops more than I, you know, I liked specimens, but I also liked geology back then. But it was really a class at uh, college, and that's I ten, where um, I caught the bug again. More geology than than minerals, but I like crystallography in particular. I liked uh, seeing what was inside of crystals and how it was organized made a lot of sense to me so 
that was the start. The real specimen part of my life came when I um, started doing research on minerals and then coming here. This was really the big opportunity, you know, so do you, a lifetime. Do you remember as a child being somewhere and finding a mineral on the ground something or was it uh, that class in elementary school that first got you interested? Well, I was interested. I remember going to Knott's Berry Farm in uh, oh, California yeah. when I was 15 or so and 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 looking at rocks that were for sale there and, and picking up a few things. And we did go take a tour of uh, Southwest and got to see more things than that. But that was, I wouldn't say that was the singular, there was no singular moment. Gotcha. I have to be honest. Uh-huh. And then when you uh, went to college and you took that class that really kind of re-sparked that interest, was that over at Harvard or at Princeton? No, that was Harvard because, that was uh, Harvard. yeah, that's when I became a, decided to major in geology instead of engineering and applied physics. And then I got my uh, graduate degree at, at Princeton where I did mostly crystallography. Great, great. And so, George, I know we want to get to the uh, the tour because we, we have a limited amount of time, but can you briefly talk to us about that uh, arc of time between Princeton and your time at the American Museum? Well, you have to realize uh, when I graduated from Princeton I uh, with my PhD, I was here even before I had my PhD. Oh, so that's I see. A, okay. that's, that's a trajectory that's almost impossible now. <laughs> Yeah. Normally you have to go through several postdocs, but so I've, I was here, I've been here 45 years. Nice. So, nice. you know, uh, most people I talked to even weren't even alive. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, terrific. Well, uh, then you've been there from the very beginning in 2017. We know that you guys closed the museum for a complete redesign to celebrate the 150th uh, year anniversary you are there in the main entrance, so why don't we go straight to the tour and uh, show us the new museum. Okay, let's do it. So as you can see here, we're now at the entrance to the mineral hall. It's the same space that the old mineral hall was in if you've been here before. It's just been totally gutted and reopened. And so one of the things that's obvious, particularly as we get to look around, is it seems bigger than it used to be. It's open, it's full ceiling height now. It's not like being underground in a mine. Mm. Um, we've added uh, signature specimens that we went out and acquired specifically for the new hall. And we're standing in front of one of them. This is a, a very large um, amethyst geode from Artigas, Uruguay. And one of the things about you can see now is that it looks like you're looking in to uh, a galaxy. We call it the Amethyst Galaxy. I love and, it. So it's really, really a beautiful specimen and a good jaw dropper for people coming in the door. And how close can you get to that? I see the guardrail, but I, I don't get a sense of distance. Well, okay, I see. So I can reach my arm in here and I can't, can't get there. Wow. That's, that's the goal. Um, what were we... Uh, you know, these are not these are not touchable. We have other specimens that are touchable, but this one is uh, for looking at, not for playing with. I'll bet you anything that's going to be the number one selfie that people will be posting online. Um, I think there are a few others. To okay. Be <laughs> so why don't we go around? So let me just let we, let's move sideways, and you can okay. take a look down the length of the hall. So this is the main axis through the mineral hall. And at the far end is the Tarugo, which is a Jonas mine tourmaline, which we have on loan for five years. We'll get closer to that. And, but this is the access through the hall. The hall is organized by mineral forming environments, which we've divided into five kind of different sections. You know, basically hydrothermal, weathering, igneous, metamorphic. And then we have pegmatites. And then we have some other cases that deal with localities or particular species as well. And then in addition to that, so that's, and then onto the left side, you can see that's the uh, systematics. So we have a complete suite of the uh, syst systematics of minerals based on chemical composition, mostly based on anions, not on cations. So that's a traditional thing about the hall. We've integrated more gems and carvings into it so people will recognize where things come from. And then right here at the entrance, we have a new section, 
This is um, mineral evolution. So this is one of Bob Hazen's uh, concepts. Absolutely. And it's presenting the entire history of the universe and where minerals fit into them. So there's the Big Bang at the center, then there's a spiral. The spiral, the length of the spiral is proportional to the length of time since the 14 billion years since the Big Bang. And it shows the first minerals to be um, formed after some large stars died would be things like graphite and diamond and olivine. Mm -hmm. And then going on, but, but mostly it's a history of our planet, the evolution of our planet, the evolution of environments, which have permitted more and more minerals to form. And particularly when you get about 2 billion years ago, when, when life started to produce oxygen in the atmosphere, and we get the great oxygenation, oxygenation event, and mm -hmm. we get a lot more color in our minerals because of the oxidized, particularly the transition elements. So that's what we try to pre present here because it's a different way of looking at mineralogy than was available perhaps 20 years ago. And then we have a, a we have a video theater here. Uh, mineral evolution is complicated enough that it's hard to present it in the written words. So we wanted to animate it and give people a better idea of what's going on. Well, now, George, let me ask you a question. With your wall there of the systematic minerals combined with uh, the mineral evolution uh, display that you just showed us, there's kind of like a nod to the uh, more, I guess, old or traditional way of displaying minerals and the whole new approach. So let me ask you, um, maybe you can share with us some of your goals or perspectives when you were designing the new museum so that we can understand that better and appreciate it as we go through uh, and look at the exhibits. Okay, so in terms of, again, of the systematic, hall, uh, systematic wall of, of minerals, that's really uh, very traditional other than the way we display things. We do it mm -hmm. our own way. Everything is mounted vertically for the most part and in clutch mounts so that there's a lot more vertical presentation of minerals and therefore a lot more space for people to mm -hmm. move around. So one of the other thing is the hall is very open. So it's a random walk to some extent. You can be attracted to something or you can just try to get around people who are in your way. So that's <laughs> certainly what we were anticipating. Um, but again, the, the, the context of all the cases that are in the center of the hall really is about the environments in which minerals form. And then subset, subsets of uh, questions like what kinds of minerals form in what kinds of areas. Uh -huh. So why don't we walk down here a little bit to get a, a view of, of what some of our systematic cases. So we're starting off here with the native elements and then the sulfides and sulfur salts. And you can see we've introduced some jewelry in this case, some carvings of graphite carvings for the other form of carbon. And everything is, is laid out. The minerals are identified on, in the case, um, but we don't really have much detail about them. That's just okay. the limitation of what we can do in terms of fixed exhibitry. I really appreciate that open kind of 3D look. It, as, as you say, there is a lot of space, both physically in the exhibit hall, but also among the different minerals. And it really allows you to focus on each individual piece rather than yeah. being distracted by shelves and uh, mounts and right. stuff like that. Right. So we use clutch mounts throughout. And when a specimen gets heavy, the clutch mount gets to be quite a massive as well. But the uh, idea is, is to present the mineral and not, not, not the way we're mounting them. And so everything was done here by our own people in the museum, mm. by our preparation staff. And so that is a, a signature of the exhibition. And in many ways, oh, exhibitions are done at the AMH. Mm -hmm. So if we walk down here a little ways. So right now we're in the igneous, if off to my right here. We're in the igneous environment. This is an orbicular granite from Western Australia, about the oldest, one of the oldest specimens in the hall, over 2 billion years old. And then we have a video in the igneous environment section trying to show something about the igneous environment. So along with going about mineral forming environments, we use the videos to create the dynamic aspect of process because that's really what people are challenged with. You know, for mm -hmm. those of us who are geologists or 
it's, you know, we understand this, we're used to looking at textbooks, but for a lot of people uh, without motion, they really don't necessarily get it. And we're trying to enhance that. This is a teaching hall. So mm -hmm. pretty much every student in uh, the New York City public school system will come through here at some point in their wow. uh, student career. And the messages are tuned to the standards for education in New York State and also the, the federal guidelines as well. Wow, that's a big responsibility. I'm really happy to see how you have risen to that challenge. Well, we actually teach uh, um, earth science students in this uh, museum. We have a Master of Arts in Teaching program, and this is one of the places they will be spending time both by themselves to learn how to use the hall and with the students when they come here. So I love the genius of approach. I love the genius of that design where just uh, Joe Blow could come in and aesthetically it, it's very in, engaging and can draw them all over, but it also uh, works as a very educational uh, hall for people who have a little bit more knowledge in, in mineralogy. Yeah. yeah, so my goal uh, for this hall is in addition to people just finding it spectacular from the mm -hmm. mineral perspective, now, also, if you come in here, I will hope that say, I didn't know that, that people yeah. will leave the hall saying, I did not know that. And that, that to me, that in an exhibition is when you succeed at making things point. So let me point out, so right in front of me is a big block of, of a labradorite pegmatite from Madagascar. And one of the things I tell people is bring along a light because it, you can't always see. So, so here's a down here, you can see the iridescence from these large labradorite sure. crystals. And so this was harvested and we knocked the corners off, make it look like a pylon. <laughs> and uh, it's a, just an example of some of the uh, singular specimens we have brought in uh, with the new hall. So um, while we're here, why don't we go over to, this is a classic specimen that people would have seen before. It's um, called the singing stone. I'll discuss what that is about in a second, but it's a block of malachite azurite ore from Bisbee, Arizona, that was extracted in about 1892, sent to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, and then given to us by the Douglas family in 1894. So it's been here in the museum since then. So it's over 100 years. Wow. Um, it's called the Singing Stone because when it was first extracted and exhibited, it was there was no uh, air conditioning, no uh, you know climate control. So what would happen is in the over the period of particularly of going from spring to summer and then summer to fall is the um, the ore body is is hydroscopic. It absorbs water from the atmosphere. So the block rose a little teeny bit and it had started squeaking, which they called <laughs> singing. So that's why it was called the singing stone. Unfortunately, I've not heard it sing um, because it's always been an air conditioning. And uh, maybe I just didn't come at the right time when the air conditioning wasn't working. Yeah, I think we have to break the air conditioning and make an audio recording of the singing. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah, certainly. It will sing no more. You must believe in the myth. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay, so we're moving right along. Why don't we move over across the way? So another of the areas that we focus on, which I'm sure is appreciated by mineral collectors and the like, is this is this is a suite of cases about pegmatites. And we try to differentiate between simple and complex pegmatites. But the signature thing about pegmatites is these large crystals, but also the rare elements that are often in the complex pegmatites. So we have things like the, the you know, the morganite barrel and aquamarine barrel. And if we move to the left, there's some spodumenes and topaz. So these are typical of, of pegmatites. Uh, pegmatite minerals are, um, you know, very popular, particularly at, at shows and stuff. So we thought that uh, presenting pegmatites would be a good idea, as well as the fact that we have a fairly good collection of pegmatites. So we have, this is just an introductory case. We have uh, a section just on tourmalines. 
we have in the corner of this case a larger elbite um, because we have this corner that's open. And so in all of our cases that have a, an angle in them, we have a signature specimen at the corner. Mm. So we have the topaz, I mean, the, the, the tourmalines here from a variety of localities. And then, right. then adjacent to them, we have the classic, the biggest topaz in captivity <laughs> that Alan Kaplan brought back from uh, Almiagerias. That has a good story that goes along with it, but I'm not going to tell you about it. You'll have to come get the story yourself. So that's that's a, a you know a hands-on specimen. We try to have a, a number of hands-on specimens because that's really way young people get acquainted with things is to touch things. Sure. Okay, so so that's a whole set of 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 cases about um, peg, uh, pegmatites, including. Uh, San Diego County pegmatites, also Mount Micah in Maine. Over here, right. we have a set a case, uh, one of the other kinds of cases, which is dedicated to a species. So this is all the varieties of quartz. Since so there's such a great variety of things with quartz, made out of quartz, we thought we could de de uh, dedicate a case just to these varieties of quartz. And then in the corner, we have a a beautiful uh, grape agate from Indonesia, mm -hmm. which came as a gift not that long ago from Mark Chodowski. That's a great piece. Nice size and good coverage. So let's go around the corner here to uh, a, a far wall. And here we have a bunch of locality cases. So the first locality case we obviously wanted to deal with is New York City itself. Oh, that's a great idea. So we have about 500 specimens of New York minerals. And one of the things that we brought back that everybody wanted to see is the subway garnet, which is yeah. the fantastic, you know, trapezohedral crystal, about five, five and a half inches across. And that hadn't been on display since about the early 80s. And for the two viewers watching who may not be aware, the American uh, Museum is right in the heart of New York City, uh, right uh, across from Central Park. So uh, that makes a very, very uh, important exhibit there as you have all the New Yorkers coming in and saying, wow, this is from this area. Right. So, I mean, the thing about New York City is it's like a giant quarry considering all the buildings that have been built. So mm -hmm. the collecting of minerals had been very important for a long time. And the root of the New York Mineralogical Club, uh, which had supplied some of these samples. Now, again, adjacent here, another locality case deals with the Hudson Highlands, which is the, was the source, a major source for iron ore for both the Revolutionary and Civil Wars. And so that's a historic, very historic area for New York City, reminding people that resources are very close by, was a very important part. New York City history. And then adjacent to it is a case that's uh, near to my heart. It's about Mogok in Myanmar. I got oh, to yeah. go there in 1998. And uh, that was very exciting to go to this place where so much different minerals and gem minerals come from. And so I started collecting actively for the museum. And so we have the representation of some of what we have in here, but much of it is also in the gem hole. And you acquired the majority, if not all of these pieces on Major your trips? The, major the majority. Uh, majority. Not on the trips. So I got hooked oh. by the, the trip, but <laughs> then started acquiring from dealers as well as I've gotten to go a couple of other times. I see. So, you know, it, it, it's a long it's a long task to collect from any locality, as anybody out there knows. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a, a, a sort of a life's work. So for me, it's not quite a career's work, but at least 20 years uh, <laughs> I spent uh, acquiring this thing. So I think that gives you an idea of, of some of the variety of, of cases with respect to localities. So why don't we go into a, a sort of a unique part of the, the mineral hall? And this is a hall called uh, Minerals and Light. And it mm. deals with um, the properties of minerals that we appreciate 
by looking at them. So it has to do with color, refractive index, dispersion, um, color change, whether it's uh, looking at a different orientation and seeing a different color or you've got a bicolor, multicolored specimen. So in here, the, the, the key specimen in here is a slice from the Sterling Hill mine in Ogdensburg, New Jersey. And this is the cap, the essentially the fluorescent capital of the world. Mm -hmm. So we, we harvested this specimen, which is 12 feet across and eight feet high because it, it displays fluorescent spectacularly, as well as this piece shows the geology of essentially a metamorphosed sedimentary deposit. And that's it under just normal incandescent it's light. So it goes through four. So this is long wave ultraviolet. So the color is somewhat different and muted. The right hand side is suspiciously blue. There's some blue fluorescent. I mean, yes. So here is short wave. So that's when you get the strongest fluorescence. And then we have the light go off and you can see the persistent luminescence ah, of the yeah. second, second generation of Willamite, which I had never seen before until uh, we sampled from this outcrop at the Sterling Hill mine. So that's another one of these. So you were asking what are people gonna be stunned at? Right. When you see this, <laughs> this is stunning. No question about it. But the idea you know, of this... I, I don't know if it's more the color changing, which is incredible in and by itself, but also the size of it. Uh, I've been to the mine and I actually filmed a, um, a program there. And when you're underground and you get to see whole areas lit up by this, it is really jaw dropping. And this is the closest I've seen to reproducing that feeling outside of actually being on the location. Yeah, that, that was the idea to give you yeah. an outcrop scale or mine, full mine wall scale of what it what it looks like Fantastic. so that's certainly kind of what you know one of our approaches is here is to give the scale of geology the scale mm. of rain, um which you can't always get by just looking at little specimens exactly so and, you know george it helps having you actually in front of some of these pieces because as we were talking about yesterday i had seen that slab in photographs that you had sent but until you were standing next to it I really didn't have a sense of scale. Yeah, I guess we didn't have people for scale bars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It certainly helps. George, before you go out, can you show us a little bit more of the cases in there when you talk about color, like the cat's okay. eyes? Or... Sure. Okay. Thank you. So the, again, this isn't the gem hall. The gem hall we do elsewhere. So here, here is a case uh, on variegation in color. So we have... Um, Leochorosum in the sense of we have a spodumene crystal, which shows that the C-axis has stronger absorption than across the C-axis. We mm -hmm. have uh, two alexandrites, one synthetic and one uh, natural, where we do uh, change the color temperature of the light. And so you can see um, they go from essentially green or blue to intense red. We have a, right below it is a albaite from Maine. And you can see we have a slice, one millimeter thick slice, looking down the C-axis where it looks orange. When you look across, it looks green. Mm. So that's very, very typical of tourmalines where they, the color changes due to the pleochroism. We have iridescence next door to that. So we have both, we have opals, we have labradorite. Um, and then we have this, this specular hem hematite that has the secondary crystal growth on it. It gives the iridescence from the secondary crystals on the surface. So iridescence is a very significant uh, characteristic, particularly for things like opals and labradorite, more fluorescence. Um, if we go to the far side, I deal with cat's eyes. This is cat's eyes and stars. So we have the light moving, but it works much better if I do this. Oh, yeah. And that's one reason why I say great people should bring bring their lights, and they can play games with the cat's eyes and the stars. So there you go, really nice milk and honey effect in a uh, crystal barrel. So this, this is, you know, both a perception issue to try and get people to understand 
what causes these effects in minerals. It's an ancillary also help for looking in the gem hall because gems are designed to take advantage of these different optical characteristics. But I consider it my little physics hall because the <laughs> idea is to present the physics without without kind of confusing everybody. Yeah. Okay, so now we're walking to the middle of the mineral hall. We're going to turn in to the gem hall. So the feature case in here contains the Star of India, which is our well-known 563 carat star sapphire. Now, again, I have the advantage of having a light. So I can show how the, you get multiple stars if you use multiple lights. And I think most people don't appreciate that characteristic of things like stars. And we have a cat's eye next door, 80, an 89 carat cat's eye. And so here I can do the milk and honey effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unfortunately, cat's eyes aren't appreciated as much in the U.S. as they are in Asia. But that's a very nice one. And then, so now you can get a kind of a full... Of, of the mineral hall, I mean, gem hall. So there are over 2,000 stones in here and 2,200 specimens. Wow. And carvings, carvings as well. So they're laid out by species or by family. And we, in addition to that, why don't we go over to the side here? One of my the things that I wanted to add was rough and cut. So mm. here is the case of, of rough and cut. A whole variety of different things. There are a few specimens in here where they're they're perfect matches. So up here, this is a from the Ocean View mine in San Diego County. Um, kunzite matching gem and crystal, 110 carat stone down here is from Gallatin, um, Montana, is a calcite. Now, calcite. George, just so to clarify for our viewers, when you say perfect match, it means that the rough and the cut are from the same crystal or just the same locality? Well, they're not the same crystal in this case, but they're from the same find within the same mine. Gotcha. Okay, so thank you. So it's a comparable, a comparable crystal. And so I know that, the, that that pocket produced the material from which that gem was cut. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that's also uh, that we use in here is that you can see that all the gems are laid out in some kind of uh, geometric pattern, but there are no labels other than maybe in the one case here, we have some numbers to give you to know which group you're looking at. But um, and then down on the on the label rail is mostly information about the gem, its historical significance or locality significance. All of the labels are digital. So the digital labels come through these touch screens, which I don't think are, yeah, they're not, they're not, oh, there it goes. So we can go with a touch screen. So come on, wake up. It was just teasing you. Yeah, it's not alive. <laughs> yeah, so so what the, one of the things is, is that we have the touch screens, but you also can access an app on your cell phone. And with that, you can uh, stand back and look to your, yeah, here we have one that's working a little better. So here we can, we can touch the screen and open it up and pick a stone. And so you get the view of the stone down from the table. So there's a, Nice. You see across, you can get an idea of the perspective of the stone. And then there's the information about the stone. So, you know, where it comes from, how big is it? And uh, if it was donated to us, who donated it to us. And all so that functionality is available on the app as well. It's, on, it's available on the app and you also can find it on the web. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. So you can actually survey the entire hall on the web. Okay, so uh, so I think that's what are we doing here? All right, we're doing not too bad. <laughs> so why don't we move to some other? Um, so here, let me show this. Look at some carvings. So one of the things 
we changed as the carving is used to be in a deep back case. So you right. only could look in one dimension. So here you there are cases in the round. So the idea is you can get a full 360 degree view of many of the of the of the objects in here. So I think that's a much better way to see carvings than to have them deep deep back in a case. Mm -hmm. So that Quan Yin is really a spectacular specimen of lavender jade. It's the Buddha, it's the Quan Quan Yin, and then in her forehead is a little dot of green, which the artist who carved this was able to pick out from the rough. So the third eye of Buddha is emerald green as opposed to the lavender color of the optic. So there are many things like that to be appreciated when you come here in person. Fantastic. And to our, for our viewers, um, it would normally take George about two hours to give a tour through the museum. We don't have that kind of time today. So if he seems a little bit rushed, just please be understanding. <laughs> yeah. So one of the questions that people ask me is, you know, like, what are my favorites in here? And to be perfectly honest, uh, there are far too many to, uh, to tell. But along with the MOGA case, let me show you this case. This is a case of jade. So I've been working on jade since about 1983. And so this represents things that I've collected and uh, things that I've worked on. Uh, so the, the source of the lavender color in this slice is something I've done some research on. This little teapot I bought in Guatemala. Um, with a, I was on, we were on a field trip, field work, and I didn't have the money in my pocket to buy this thing. So I had to borrow money from everybody I was with <laughs> so, I, so I could buy this. And the, the thing that you can't appreciate is if I could put a light inside the teapot, it would glow. Oh, wow. So really, really cool. So this is, you know, so this is near and dear to my heart. Some of these specimens I collected myself. So, you know, George, let me ask you about that teapot. Was that sold as a piece of art or was it actually a functional teapot that they just happened to be carving out of jade? I think it was both. Okay. So we actually bought it from the carver in a, and, in and a small town. It wasn't, wasn't in Guat City. It was okay. uh, in San Arate, I think, where, uh, where one of my former graduate postdocs had found this guy who was carving and he was collecting toads. So this guy carved toads for him. Oh, neat. And, and have you ever had a cup of tea from that? No. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. I haven't done that. It's a little small for that. <laughs> and I acquired it for the museum. So I feel a little, that's a little bit uh, taking sure. advantage of things. Sure. So adjacent to this is a, is a case on garnets, um, which everybody loves. And included down on the base is how garnets are so useful in doing interpreting geology, which includes some work we've done on heclogites, which are garnet omphacite rocks from Guatemala. So we actually uh, present some of the science in here. But again, the idea is the variety of garnets and some of the ways they've been used to cut. We cut stones. We have one cut stone from Gore Mountain. So people may be familiar with Gore Mountain as a sort of source of abrasive garnet and generally you don't be, you're not able to cut stones out of them but if we move next door here this is one of our big specimens which we what i call harvested for this new exhibition it is a slab 16,000 pound slab of garnet amphibolite from gore mountain in upstate new york in the adirondacks and this is famous for the very large garnets that come out of it that all have fractures in them so they could be used as abrasive when they were ground up. So they used to make emery boards and there used to be, when I was doing wood shop, we had garnet paper for sanding mm -hmm. things. Sand the garnets, paper, right. came, garnets came from Gore Mountain. And this particular specimen was one of five that we actually cut off of an outcrop at Gore Mountain. And you can see there's a boundary in it where there are big garnets on one side, smaller garnets on the other side. And it's sort of like, what's the, the question is, how come? Why big ones on one side, smaller ones on the other? 
I think there's a fault running through this that got healed. But anyway, so the idea is, again, to provide the scale to see how big minerals can grow in the solid mm -hmm. state. So mm -hmm. these aren't growing in cavities or in pegmatites or something. This grew as a solid rock. And that, to me, is, is mind-boggling. And I think it's interesting to note that you acquired that in 2017, right after you had closed the museum, or maybe you know close to that time. So this is the first time that's on exhibit. And yeah. why don't you tell tell the viewers real quickly uh, the, what you had to do to get that in the exhibit hall and why it's never leaving? Oh, okay, so so this this piece again it weighs sixteen thousand pounds. It's uh, twelve feet by eight feet, and we don't have any doors in the hall that can do that. But if we turn around behind here and, and to go behind the Tarugo, there's a wall here which shows a graphic of, of the what's going to be behind here when a new building opens at the museum, hopefully in 2022. Well, this was built as a connector to another building that was not built back in 1909. And so while construct before construction started on the new building, we opened up this wall and trucks brought in these specimens and we had gantries. We reinforced the floors and they brought these things and rolled them in, suspended them on, on cables and then put them on mounts, which we had previously designed and made. And in fact, that Gore Mountain Garnet has supports in the basement to shore up the floor because it's too heavy for the floor load. So that we had to do a lot of you know, engineering to go along with installing these big specimens. And in fact, the cases came in the same way. They came through the hole in the wall. See, these cases are eight feet tall. And so they're pretty hard to get in um, through a doorway. Fantastic. So let's turn around here because this is a specimen that some people may have seen in 2017 in at Tucson. Yes. It's the famous... Tarugo, um, tourmaline specimen from the Jonas mine that was on display both at the Westward Look and then at the show. I remember when at the show, I couldn't get within six feet of the specimen because of all the people clustered around sure. the case. Yeah, but, I remember so that well. Yeah, so this is a spectacular specimen that we initially tried to acquire but uh, we're not able to, but we're able to uh, arrange with the, uh, um, John Gillespie, who became the sole owner of the, of the object. And he has it on loan to us uh, for the next five years. And if you send your nickels and quarters to us, <laughs> we may be able to acquire this. But that's certainly my goal is for this never to leave here. I know John is happy for it to be close to home in Connecticut. So we can come and take a good look at it. And I think this is a good home for it. I think everybody can agree about that. I couldn't agree more. I remember when that was revealed at that Tucson show, it was really the talk of both shows. It was such an incredible unveiling that we were actually able to see one of the big Jonas pieces. And yeah. since then, I never knew what happened to it. Uh, I was worried that it had left the country, but I'm extremely happy to see it right there in your mineral hall. Yeah, well, let's say I started hustling as soon as I saw that. <laughs> we call that the Harlow hustle. <laughs> well, every so often, you know, some, <laughs> some, some specimens are just that that good. And with the opportunity of having a new hall, it was like would be a big mistake not to be able to get something like this. Absolutely. Now, are you finding that same reaction among the visitors to the museum now where they kind of tend to congregate around that uh, several people deep? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't stand around as a tour guide in, mm -hmm. in the hall. Typically, I have gone through with colleagues and friends and showing them around. And mostly I've been able to do that, let's say, early before things get busy or gotcha. even when the hall isn't open like it is today. So we're not open every day of the week. We hopefully will be. So we're open uh, Wednesdays through Sunday. Um, one thing I'll tell people who are coming to visit, I really would like you to come and visit, is that is the hall has a virtual line. So when you come to the museum, you have to basically visit our website to get a ticket. 
And then as soon as you're in the hall, there's a QR code to, to get in line to go into the mineral hall. And if you don't get here early, you may wind up on the end of the line and not get into the hall. Wow. That's, right now, it's, this is the place to visit in this museum. I, I mean, there's imagine. been a lot of good media coverage about it, including what we're doing today. And so it's a very popular place. There's a lot of pent up hunger to see minerals again, to see the mineral that's, hall again. That's great. And to so hear. Yep. It's, it's very successful right now. Okay. And as, so you said Wednesdays to Sundays, the museum is open to the public. Uh, you have to register online, get your QR code uh, well, you get, as soon you as you show online, up. You register online to you get, get a ticket. ticket. Gotcha. Okay. And once you've got into the museum, then you can scan the QR code to get in line. And I see. Uh, there are other ways of doing this, but I'm not going to go into details. But Sure. And what is the current capacity of the halls uh, with these measures in place? Um, I'll, well, I'll, let me tell you, it started off at, at 150. Next day, it went to 250. Next day, it went to 350. Um, I'm pretty sure it's over 500 people are allowed in here now at a time. So sure. the other thing is, is when people are coming in, the getting in requires somebody else to leave Going once out. you get the capacity. So, um, but the th in general at the museum, uh, early birds catch the worm. It's much better to get here early. You'll, you may feel more relaxed. Um, you won't get jostled uh, by other visitors. Uh, maybe you like that. Uh, getting that. But, you know, we're still in COVID time. <laughs> I'm not wearing my mask right now, but you have to wear a mask to visit the museum. And gotcha. as we know, COVID is going kind of biz bizarre lately. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, wearing masks is going to be with us for some time. Sure. But that sure. certainly doesn't stop you from appreciating uh, the minerals in the mineral hall. Exactly. All right, let's continue our tour here. What are we looking at here? We've got, uh, okay, we're so about this, uh, 15 minutes from the end of the hour. Okay. So we're now on the other side of the mineral forming environments areas. Right here is um, hydrothermal. So because water exists on planet Earth, we have the benefits of what water does, which is transport elements and permits crystallization. And when they're open cavities, whether they're veins or actual um, pockets you can form you know crystals that are revealed in their total beauty unlike they are typically in rocks and that's what most of us are familiar with and most of these are the result of mining right mm -hmm. i think some people don't like to remember that but that is the case mining or quarrying is what reveals pockets from which crystals are um, collected and this is an example uh, to show how water does the all of these were deposited from water. We have a little diagram of water molecules and how they accumulate uh, with cations and anions to move the, the chemical components around, and then they can recrystallize when the conditions are right to crystallize the mineral. So this is, again, part of the educational approach to what we're doing in this hall. Terrific. So, in, so one of the things is at the, so we had mineral evolution at the far end, and here we have what we call mineral basics. So what's the difference between, you know, a, a mineral, a crystal, and a rock? And okay. here we have some touchable specimens where we've, uh, we think we've anchored them good, good enough for New York teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate behind, test. <laughs> so behind us, we have an, a, uh, a video where we discuss these same features in a video. And again, one of the things that if people left here knowing that ice is a mineral, I think we've made an advance because I don't think most people realize that ice is a mineral and that snow is a chemical sediment. Absolutely. And, and then there's a part of other part of crystal basics is the crystallography, which we've done in qu quite abbreviated form compared to some places where it's been done. So, you know, the crystal systems, then crystal symmetry, and then finally twins. Much of this was exhibited at Tucson one time. More issues of hydrothermal. 
So why don't we look at a couple of other specimens, some signature specimens that are in here. Mm -hmm. So um, so here, here we have a fluorite specimen that is uh, decorated with pyrite from the Moscona mine in Asturias in Spain. And so you can see that this is a fantastic specimen I bought out of the back of an SUV at Tucson. <laughs> and what, what it, it's also extremely good educational specimen because it shows the snow on the roof effect. So if we move around to this side where there's a cavity, no pyrite in there because that wasn't facing up. The snow of pyrite uh, falling out of the water sure. in this pocket did not land there. And then finally we have the ringers, which are several calcite crystals sitting on top, but no pyrite. So for me, this is a teaching specimen. Sure, really exactly. Teach people about how processes work. And uh, that, I mean, when I saw this, it was, wow, that's so good. You can be both beautiful and informative because for me every specimen in here tells a story and as as mineralogists and geologists that's what we're supposed to do interpret the stories of the minerals i love that people could come and appreciate the beauty of the specimen uh, and that's enough but then the more uh, educated people um, can actually use that to learn and see that whole process happening there that's wonderful right. and certainly this is the story we'll present to teachers who will be coming through here so they can help their students interpret the minerals Great. that we've got in here. Some people Great. think that you lose some of the fascination when it's no longer just beauty. For me, it's just the other no, way around. I the, agree the with you 100%. Is, the beauty is so much um, magnified mm -hmm. when you can understand what was going on that made this and what a spectacular planet we live in and how lucky we are to be able to appreciate this and interpret it. Absolutely. So here's another specimen that has, has been on display for a while before. Um, it's uh, a stibnite, massive stib, stibnite specimen from the Wuling mine in China. And um, so you can see these swords of stibnite coming off of it. Some of my colleagues here thought this looked like a hedgehog. <laughs> the, face, the face down here, and then they called it stibby. Stibby the Hedgehog. Um, at first, I was kind of like, no, this is a spectacular s specimen. What are you talking about, Hedgehog? But anyway, I think there's a lot of uh, truth to it. In fact, um, my colleagues have uh, T-shirts with Stibby on them. So there you go. Well, George, I would submit that the real collector T-shirt will have Stibby on the back and Harlow Hustle on the front. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So how are we doing? Are we, I think we're about ready for Q&A, maybe. Okay. Um, George, let's do this. Let's go into our quick fire questions. These are five questions that I'm going to ask you. All of your answers are correct. Uh, the viewing audience has already answered, so they're going to try to predict how you are going to answer, uh -huh. and we'll see how they do. Um, are you ready? This is no way to treat a curator emeritus. No, oh, I know. Yeah, but, go hey. ahead. That's just our so, show. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, number shoot. one, favorite drink, margarita or beer? Oh, margarita. Mar that's without even a hesitation. Okay, question number two, favorite food, enchilada or sushi? Oh, enchilada. Enchilada. Number three, because you, uh, Catherine Dunnell, uh, made a note that you are known as the Jade Hunter. So what is your favorite jade, Guatemala or Burmese? Um, I have to be honest and say Burmese. Burmese, right on. Okay. Um, favorite cottage? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. Favorite cottage? Do you Would you prefer to live in a cottage in the mountains or a cottage by the sea? Probably by the sea. By the sea. Wow. Okay. And final question. This is the toughest of them all. Gem mineral or gemstone? Um, gem mineral. Gem mineral. mineral. Beautiful. Mineral. Okay. Then, um, Eloise, are you ready with our viewers' answers? Yes, I am. 
Okay. Number one, favorite drink, margarita or beer? George chose margarita. What did our readers, our viewers say? They need to come to Tucson to watch uh, George drink margaritas because they're wrong. They answer beer. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've been to, to uh, Tucson, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, favorite food, enchilada or sushi? George went with enchilada. Enchiladas, yes. Okay. Viewers went with enchilada. We got one correct there. Uh, favorite jade for George Harlow, the jade hunter, Guatemala or Burma? Burma. Yes. Burma. Nice. People know their George. Favorite cottage? Did they go for in the mountains or by the sea? And they got it wrong. Mountains. You know, I would have guessed mountains also, so uh, I can't blame them. So we are tied, too wrong, too correct. Final question, gem mineral or gemstone? Yes, gem minerals, of right course. Right on. Our viewers are the winners. Fantastic. All right, let's go to the Q&A section. Um, Eloise and Raquel, if we and have any questions Brian, for you know, George. Uh, Raquel had the chance to go to the museum recently, and I think she should share her experience because George is from the inside. Uh, it would be nice to have the experience from the outside and with Raquel. So Raquel, what did you think of the museum? What was, what was your favorite? I don't think I could be an outsider because I completely <laughs> am symbiotic with George. Everything he does for me is my big kudos. Mineral evolution, all the gems, the carvings, the systematics have to be in there. But understanding processes, trying to put minerals into context with geology is very difficult to do without sure. enough text. And he has done it. So I was like, oh, <laughs> it's a dream come true. So my congratulations, 100%. Yeah, Thank congratulations you, Raquel. Thank you, George. It's really, yes. it's really great. As soon as she was out of the museum, she was sending us pictures, George. It yeah. was really awesome. So George, you have a lot of congrats. Amazing, beautiful. I will let um, Raquel ask you some, some questions. We have a bunch of questions, but a lot of congrats in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing everybody here. Yeah. <laughs> will be there. Yeah, I, I, I think that the questions is people is just standing on oh, but yes, we have a few questions. Uh, Bob Byers was asking if the previous steep night locality display is still intact. The previous which? The steep night locality display. Um, I mean, the grouping of stib nights uh, within a stib night case. No, we don't have that. We Stibby was on display before in the grand gallery but not in the mineral hall but no we don't have a separate display of stib nights most we we really have far fewer cases devoted to a single species or a single family yes thanks um we have a question by Jeannie season which i think uh, you're probably not gonna answer which is your favorite mineral <laughs> Come on, George, give her the eye roll that you gave me when I asked you the same question yesterday. <laughs> uh, no, I, that, that, that one doesn't work for me. I'm sorry, Ginny. I mean, you know I like jadeite and I like echolagites as rocks and blue schists, but uh, that's not quite the same as favorite mineral. <laughs> We One more of a practical question. What happens if you don't have an iPhone in the gallery? What if you don't have what? An iPhone and a smartphone. How do you work around the gallery? Well, the gallery, the only place where there are digital labels is in the gem hall, and we do have the touch screens within the gem hall. So certainly I don't like the idea of, of having um, information that's only available to well-off people. I think that's mm. really not fair. Um, but nowadays, smartphones are almost ubiquitous even with kids but again we don't have the digital uh information in the mineral hall it's a it's a goal we have down the road and as i said before we're hoping down the road we'll actually have digital labels in like five languages and i think that would be a, a real benefit because new york is a really international town at least it will be again once we're open to you know once covid has been tamed enough 
It mm. should be, but we're not really doing a good enough job, particularly abroad. Um, but uh, it's only the gem hall that has the digital labels. And again, they're available on touchscreens in the, in the hall itself. Beautiful. How many mineral specimens are on display? Um, there's a little over 5,000 mineral specimens, including, including gems, all right? So they're about, as I said, they're about 22, uh, 2,000 gems, about 2,200 specimens in the gem hall. And then uh, it's about 5,300 objects in, in the hall because we have lots of rocks in here as, as well as minerals. So it's more than any other hall in the museum. The thing that's really, I think, spectacular is the hall maintains an openness mm -hmm. and a view. You can look around and see many, many cases in any one location. Part of the goal of that is serendipity. You be attracted to what attracts you. Also, if it's busy, you, you aren't stuck in line waiting to see the next thing. You can say, okay, I'm going to go look at something else. And certainly that was a design criterion that we did when working with the designers is to try and keep it as open as possible. And there's another reason, which is they're expecting this to be a great party venue. So they yes. needed space for sure. tables, <laughs> right? Yeah, that would yes. be wonderful. Yeah. We are looking forward to the official kind of opening so we all can go and have a great party. <laughs> yeah, so am I. So am I. We're, we're hoping we maybe... bring the margaritas. We would. Yeah. Go. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that uh, perhaps in the fall, uh, when again it's partially related to to taming COVID, and when you can have sit downs and uh, and yes, everybody was expecting a great party for the opening of this hall. Me especially, of and course. it hasn't <laughs> happened. Has not happened. It will and, happen. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah. it will. But if okay. not, for those of you, you know, please come. Um, and if you can contact me, um, if, if I'm available, I'm usually willing, as long as this doesn't get to be too hectic. Mm -hmm. I'll be glad to show you, show you around and tell you my little stories that go along with lots of the specimens. <laughs> Bring a margarita, give it to George. He'll tell well, you. Well, we don't drink. We stories. can't drink the margaritas in the hall. We'll have to do that outside. <sighs> okay. George, a couple more questions if we have a few more minutes. Uh, what kind of uh, climate control system and humidity you have within the cases? Are they individually controlled? So um, some of the cases, um, uh, particularly ones, things like opals and sulfides, have uh, silica gel in, inside of them that we, we have to rotate every so often to try and maintain uh, constant uh, humidity. But the climate, the, the hall has a new HVAC system. So that's been working pretty well to keep things fairly constant. And, uh, and then the other thing is all of the cases are gasketed. So they're, mm -hmm. I think they're better than the previous generation that we had. But as anyone knows, with this much glass, uh, these big cases, uh, will be a challenge to keep things under control. But fortunately, most minerals are quite stable under these conditions. So it's not it's not a general purpose concern. Again, the opals and sulfides are that some some of the uh, hydrated sulfates and stuff you have to worry about. But for the most part, um, it's not. A, I don't think it's a giant problem. And again, the the HVAC system is brand new, and so hopefully that will keep things smooth. Very good. And last question, because I know we have limited time. We want to hear about the Subway Garnet. The story okay. about it. Well, again, uh, uh, we'll go back to the Subway Garnet. Beautiful space. We don't Stop mind walking around. Their video. <laughs> Really amazing when you walk around like this. Such a great space. So here, here we have. Um, this is the subway garnet, and there's the story about it. So it was discovered in a in a sewer excavation on uh, West Thirty Fifth Street in 1885, 
And um, it was pulled out. And one of the first people to find out about it was George Frederick Kunz. <laughs> and apparently he, he partially acquired this and started. He was the one who kind of made it popular. I don't know whether he came up with the story of the subway garnet. The subway wasn't open until 1905, after Boston, actually. And so there's no, there were no subway excavations going on. So I think it's more about being euphonious that a uh, sewer garnet wouldn't, you know, that <laughs> doesn't sound too good. So subway garnet sounds better. And, it, you know, you have to excavate for both. So I think that's probably how it happened. So it, it, in essence, the specimen first went to Kunz, then it went to the New York Mineralogical Club, and then it, then it came here. Beautiful. Thank you, George. Yeah, I think I agree. Sewer Garnet may not have uh, had the same uh, the same not ring. Too, not too good. <laughs> so one of the things that we didn't show while we're on our way out here is having a large amethyst geode basically gives you a one-dimensional look. And mm. so our president, Ellen Futter, said, it's not going to look good if you see the keister of the, uh, of the geode, so why don't we get another one? And so, in fact, this geode here was the was the first one we acquired. And it was because not wanting to see the back that we got the second one. I love so it. This, this one is spectacular in part because it has so many bumps and like noses inside of it. Inside of it, and right. I, and I found out from the from the the company, the guy who mined this. This specimen was not upright when it was found. It was sideways. It had been pushed over by the lava flow. And so mm -hmm. all of these noses and stuff on it are little fractures where the lava came through. So they're little dribbles upon which the amethyst quartz and then the amethyst grew. So really, I, you know, this is a story about a unique aspect of one specimen that I, if I hadn't asked the, uh, the guy from the company would never have known why it's so different than all the other geodes. That's a great lesson. Always ask questions. Yep. And then, George, why but do then you I, I, had to, I actually had to write this up about two weeks ago because I realized I was the only one who knew it. So now <laughs> I've written it up and we'll go along into the collection data. Why nice. do you decide which one should go in the front? Which one should be the opening piece? Okay, the, the problem is you're coming through a doorway. And when you're looking through the doorway, the tall one, you wouldn't see the top of it. Mm. Whereas the shorter one, you will see the entire thing. Whereas here we're in the hall, and so you have the full ceiling height to look up at it. So that, that's why one was chosen for the entrance and one was chosen to be the attractor from the far end of the hall. Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So Raquel, is that it with uh, questions? We have any more questions? Yes, I think the only main question, George, is if people want to get in touch with you, should they do it through your info at the museum or through what would be a contact info? However they can. Okay. <laughs> However, Just go to the can. museum, knock on the door. Hey, is George here? Yeah, no, 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 no. Not, no, okay. It's not fair to surprise me. Okay. <laughs> okay, see, that clarification I, was remember, important. I am, I am now retired. I, I don't come here every day. Ah, good point. I mean, I work still, and I can do a lot of work from home like everybody's been doing during COVID. I can do a lot of the work that I'm doing writing right now. I don't need to be in the museum, so... Sure. That's one. That's one aspect, and the other thing is, um, you know, you want you want to be friendly. You don't want to get me angry at you, right? <laughs> angry George is not the George that yeah, you want. Yeah, grumpy to spend George time with. is not what you want. Grumpy George, that's great. So we got the Harlow hustle and the grumpy George. I love grumpy George. Or, or 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 as other people know me as the curmudgeon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, George, we want to thank you and your entire team for taking this day and allowing us to come into the museum um, and look at what a wonderful job you did. For all our viewers out there, stay tuned in two weeks from today on August 
4th, we are going to have Laszlo Kupi on our show. And he is the founder of Fine Mineral Photography out of Budapest, Hungary. Uh, check Laszlo out on Instagram and Facebook. He is an absolutely wonderful photographer. And we are thrilled to have him on the show. From all of us here at Mineral Talks Live, it is honestly great to be back. Thank you all for joining us. And again, a big thank to everybody at the American Museum of Natural History. Have a great two weeks. We'll see you soon. Thank you all. And I would like to thank Erin Erin and Kendra and Roberto from the American Museum as well, who have been helping a lot. And thanks for the American Museum for agreeing to do that show today. Thank you so much. It's good to have you all back as well. See you soon.